So, today, I'm going to be doing something a little different. Uh, you know that I use scripture a lot, and that I, I like to be in the Word, and that I spend a lot of time studying it. At least I hope you know that, because I share it a lot. Uh, today's going to be a little different in that I'm going to share a lot of scripture with you. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture to you. And I don't think that's a negative thing, but I want you to understand why I'm sharing the way I'm sharing this morning. You see, in our power tools today, this, the, the power tool that we're going to be looking at is really covered thoroughly through the scriptures. And I have always tried hard in every message that I've ever preached, in every message or teaching that I've ever taught, to keep very close to what the scriptures say. Today's power tool is covered through the scriptures. So I'm going to have a little bit of stuff in there, but it's going to be scripture. So you're going to take home the word of God as it's presented through his word, assembled word in our scriptures today. Okay? I hope that's okay with you. Our first power tool explored was the tool of prayer. And we established that we want to become a house of prayer, right? We talked about what it takes to be a house of prayer and how we all need to be people who attend this place of worship because we want to be a people of prayer. Each of us, to make this happen, would need to make a commitment to pray for our own needs and the needs of our TCMC community throughout the week. That's not just on Sunday or just on Wednesday or just when you're together with each other, but it's throughout the week. As you spend time with God, praying about your needs, your wants, the things that burden you, just like we do collectively every week, but also praying about those things for everybody else represented in our community. We said that for this to happen, we would need to begin to put other people and their needs before God in our daily prayer time. Right? If we're going to become a house of prayer, it's not just about us. It's not even just about our community that gathers here. It's about people and what they need. You have a lot of people in your world. See, each of us, we live on the same planet, but each of us have our own world. That's the people that we touch and the people that touch us. And so we have people that we need to be praying for. And so if we're going to be a house of prayer, we need to be able to do that every day in our daily <laughs> prayer time. And we need to be expecting Him to bless them to heal them, to supply their needs, right? We need to know that as we come before God, He says He'll listen. He says He'll do what we ask, even more than we ask. And so we have to realize through faith that what we're praying, we're praying, believing that He will answer Last week, we shared about the importance of the scriptures. And we said that this is a power tool that gives us the history of who we are. It's, it's uh, what supplies us the challenge to live as he created us to live. As we read the scriptures, we see what he has for us. And we realize that there's more to this life than just spending a little bit of time together with a bunch of people in a place that we call our church. There's more to that. And we get that from reading in His Word. His Word blesses. His Word leads. His Word challenges us. We said that the Bible tells us the story of redemption. And that this story is history. His story. History. Right? It's His story. His story is contained in this Word. And we said that His story changes us as we apply what we read 
to the way we live our lives. See, there's a big word there that's not very many letters. It's called apply. It says apply. We can read all day. As a matter of fact, I have some, well, I haven't had, I haven't been acquainted with them recently, but I've had in my past a lot, actually, of atheistic type friends. Not all of them being atheists, not all of them being agnostic, but a lot of questions and not really willing to follow. And I've had people tell me, I've read the Bible, I've read it a few times, straight through, all of it, Old Testament, New Testament, I've read it all. I just don't see what you're talking about. So you can read Scripture and not apply it to your life. You can read what the words say and not allow the holiness, the spiritual side of them, of these words. You can do it so that it does not affect you. But there's also something in there that says that his word will not return void. Which means that if we read it and we have our eyes open, we'll see it. And so the more we read, the more we're challenged to live. The more we're challenged to live, the more people that don't read or read it with closed eyes will see what it means to live what it says. That word apply means a lot. So that's what we talked about in the past. This week, I want us to look at the power tool that has, let me start that over. I want us to look at a power tool that we have because of the first two power tools. Because we pray, because we read the scriptures, we now have another tool that we can use. And that tool is the power of love. Mm. Right? We have love because we spend time praying to God. We have love because we spend time reading studying and living this word. That's why we have love. Now, I know that many of you have spent much of your life in the church. And since you've been in the church, you've probably already had a pretty good background of what love means. But for the sake of those who maybe don't, or maybe haven't, or maybe just need to hear again, let me give you a little bit more of what love means scripturally. See, in the Greek language, it took four words to make up one word that we use as love. Do you realize that we say, I love my wife, I love my children, I love my car? Do you realize we do that? Do you realize that we say, I love my wife, I love my children, I really love people? You, you realize that, right? So we use one word to say a lot of different things. And in the Greek, it's not quite that way. They have four words that they use for that. This in no way is a full definition of those four words. But it should give you an overview so you get an idea what I'm talking about when I say love. Agape love. Agape love is the unconditional love of God. It's much like the love that a parent feels toward their children. Right? Because there's not a lot of parents that stop loving their children because of something they do or say. Agape love is unconditional love. It can't be earned. It just is. Because. And that's the love that we really struggle hard to try to explain, right? When you say, and I know all of you guys have had this question asked of you, if you're married at least, or if you've been with a girl for any amount of time, why do you love me? Why do you love me? And all of us guys say, please don't ever ask me that again. I just do. It's just there. It's what I am. You're everything to me. They don't get it. Why, girls? Why don't you get it? I don't either. But trust us when we say we love you because we love you because we love you. That's it. We have lots of good words and that's it. We love you. 
So deal with it. <laughs> you know, it's really bad. It's really bad, but it's all of us. And I talk to other guys because, you know, my wife's only asked me this once. Right. Right. But I've talked to other guys saying, do they ask you, why do you love them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, they all do. And what do you say? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> right? Right. Agape love. It's that love that we really can't explain, but it's unconditional. Filio. Filio love. Filio love is the affectionate, warm, and tender, friendly love. That's what we have amongst us. It's we want to be with each other, we like to be with each other, but we can have enough of each other, right? It's, it's a friendly love. It's warm. It's exciting. It's good. We look forward to it. But when it's over, it's over. It's friendly. You can have agape love for somebody and not have filio love for those people. You get that? You can have agape love for somebody but not feel filio love for those people. Then there's Eros love. Most of us know about Eros love. Eros love is the passionate and intense love that arouses romantic feelings. Right? That's the one that you don't ever want to hear the preacher talking about. <laughs> yeah. Eros love. Eros love is the love that you feel in your body. It's in your bones. It moves you. Hopefully, this is the love that you and your spouse share. It's that kind of love. You just can't wait to be with each other, to touch each other again. That's Eros love. And then there's Storge love. Storge love is family and friendship love, like that of a mother or a father or a very good friend, but it's not the same as Phileo love. See, Storge love is kind of like dutiful love. You do it out of duty. They raised you so you respect them. They, um, they, they have done these things, sacrificed these things for you, so you don't want to turn your back on them. That's still love. That's storge love. Okay? Storge love is sometimes unfeeling. It's more out of respect than because you want to be with them. This is the love that holds people in place when they really want to go elsewhere. You know, when, when your children grow up and they really want to move away and do something, but eh, mom and dad have done a lot. Mom and dad have all of this for me. They've set this aside for me. And by me not taking it, I'm kind of like snubbing my nose with them. That, that's not really right. That's storge love. Is it okay? Sure, it's okay. But it's not love that feels in our bones. It's not unconditional love. It's a love that holds you there. So, now that you know what I mean when I talk about love, let's see what we can do with a power tool that is called love. We're told throughout the scriptures that we're made to love. Right? We're made to love. Right at the beginning, in the creation, God loved His creation. And He saw that it was good. He loved the people who followed Him. Look at the commandments in the second commandment. He loved those people. And He told them to love Him. He, through Jesus told us to love each other. In John 15, 12, he talks about us loving each other. We need to love. That's what the Bible's telling us. Now, there's also the classic scriptures that I'm sure most of you know and can quote, like John 3, 16. See if you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Right? So that's classic 
we all know John 3.16 says God loved. And if you watch a football game this past weekend, or if you watch one this afternoon, somebody will have a sign somewhere that says John 3.16. It's always there. Nobody ever gives a definition of it. Nobody ever tells anybody about it. It just says John 3.16. But it's there. Because God so loved. We all know that. Romans 5.8 But God shows His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love. Unconditional. Maybe all four. Right? Romans 8, 37 and 38 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. That kind of covers it all, doesn't it? <laughs> Will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love. How about Galatians 2.20? It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Love. It's all through Scripture, right? I bet if you were asked, where can I find a passage about love? I would bet most of you would open your Bibles and turn right to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? The love chapter. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Ouch. Just hear what that says. If I have the gift of prophecy, and know all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not arrogant. It's, love does not brag. It's not jealous. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. But rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But... If there's gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away. If there's tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then, face to face. Now I know in part. But then I will know fully. Just as I also have been fully known. But now, faith, hope, love. Abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Right? You know that chapter. I told you I was going to use a lot of scripture today. You know that chapter. Every time you've been to a, a wedding, you've probably heard at least a part of it. I know if you've been to any that I've done, you've heard a part of it. I know you've heard me talk about how when I first read that after coming to Christ, I said, oh no. Oh no. I don't really love my wife. I don't really love my son because I can't love like that because that kind of love takes something special 
It takes something spiritual. It takes something else to love through me. To be able to love like that. That's unconditional. That's a God. And then when I first came to Christ, I didn't understand agape love. I learned it. And I live a completely different life today because of it. But when I first met Christ, everything was somewhat conditional. Even though all of these are great passages, and all of these have good instruction about love, I actually haven't gotten to the passage that we're going to talk about today. Okay? There's one letter contained in our scripture that seems to be set apart with the intention of calling all people to understand love. One letter that really, really encompasses love in this book. It's the letter of 1 John. It's the letter of 1 John. And I'm going to be reading a lot of chapter 3. And I'm going to be reading all of chapter 4 except for the first seven verses. To be honest with you, I feel like this is a sermon. I feel like this is John intentionally writing down his words for a sermon. And probably he did. Because John was a preacher. John had a church. He led a church. He would have been the pastor. Matter of fact, he's often called the pastor or the preacher. He led a group of believers with a passionate heart. And his writings seem to be instructions as well as pleadings to the people who read them. He wanted all people to know the love of God. And he really wasn't afraid to stand up for what he believed Jesus walked this earth to accomplish. John was willing. John, if you ever want to do a really good history about one of the apostles, John's the one. John went through some things that none of the other ones did. You know why? I don't know why, but John didn't die. And they tried to kill him. That's why he ended up on the Isle of Patmos and why he received the, the revelation was because he didn't die. Keep that in mind. I'm not going to tell you what happened. I'm going to let you figure that out on your own. At least today. I might tell you later. Alright, so 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11. I'm going to read this. I'm in the New American Standard if you care to follow along. But for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil, and his brother, his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth, and we and will assure our hearts before him. In whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. That's love. That's love explained. But he goes on in chapter 4. And so starting in verse 7, it says this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. 
And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. It's pretty straight, isn't it? For God is love. By this, the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love, if we love one another, God abides. Uh -oh, sorry, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. However, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. Now figure that out. He just said God is love. <coughs> right? And then He said God abides in us. That means love abides in us. Mm -hmm. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also we in this so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfect in, perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I, I feel like every time I read that, and I, I read that over and over and over, getting preparing for it today, every time I read that, I felt like I should just say, Amen. Have a great day. I mean, that is a message. That's not watered down. That's not politicized, right? That's not... There is nothing adulterated in that at all. It's a pure message that God loves you and that if you love Him, then you will love others. Because it says you can't say you love God and hate your brother. You can't say you love God and not do something about the needs of the world. You can't. And that's what that's talking about. I don't want to step on feet. I don't want to step on toes. I don't want to trample on somebody. But you know what I hear often over and over and over, and not just here, but everywhere I go? Well, preacher, you know, if we take care of our own, the rest of the world would be fine. <laughs> you missed the whole point. Go back and read all what I just read. Because if you're all about local ministry, local love, local help, and nothing out, you miss the whole point. You can't love local if you don't love all. That's what God says. Does that mean everybody needs to be a missionary? No. At least not overseas. Maybe somewhere, wherever God opens that door. Might be outside your front door, in which case you're local. But it might be down the street. It might be around the corner. It might be in the next country. Might be in the next town. Who knows? It's just whatever God lays on your heart. You should be doing it, not just focusing on what you want to do. Sorry, that's way off my notes. Obviously, from these passages, God 
you can see that God is a God who gives love. That's why we can call it a power tool. Because God gives it to us. He gave us the gift of prayer. He showed us how to pray. Over and over and over, he showed us how to pray. And then he used Jesus. Right? He gave us the gift of his word. He had people write it down. He let them write it down in their own personality so that we could relate. Because if he wrote it down in God's personality, it'd be way up here and none of us would get it. But he wrote it so that we would get it and so that we could have it to use, to grow, to share. And then he gives us a power tool called love. John's very straightforward in writing and teaching that God is love. What he means by this is that God is an emotion. But all love, I'm sorry, I think I said that God is an emotion. I meant God is not an emotion. God is not an emotion. But that all love comes from and through God. If you really want to get love, you need God in your life. In other words, you can't truly know God, or you can't truly know love until you know God. Now I'm getting things mixed up in my head, I'm sorry. But you can't truly know love until you know God. Now, wait a minute, preacher, right? Wait a minute. You've gone too far now, because I have always loved my wife and kids, even before I became a follower of Christ. Well, here's the truth. I believe, and I know this is true because of all, I guess I know all of this is true for me because of all of the studying that I've done. Hopefully it will resonate with you. You may have loved with Eros or Storge or even with some Thaleo love. You were created with the ability to desire, to, desire, to lust, to feel love in your bones. You were created to understand nurture, to understand care for another human being. You were created to understand connection and respect for others. But unconditional love is another story. Everyone has a point where we cut off the hurt. We can only be hurt so many times by the same person before we stop allowing them the opportunity to hurt us. And when we reach that point, when we've had enough, when we decide, that's it, we're done, we separate ourselves from those people. A video, I had no idea they were going to show, but that video kind of shows that. The dad loved his daughter. But that's too far. We're not going there. Sorry, you're out. Might have hurt, but he stopped, right? That's not unconditional. And all of us are there. And we say that we love our children and we love our spouse enough that we won't go there. But the truth is, when your child or your spouse does enough, there's a point where you stop. You say, okay. Sorry, I'm done. And none of us will ever, ever shake our head like this because none of us want to admit it. But it's true. See, at that point, it's the beginning of losing the agape type love that we were created to enjoy. Agape love comes into our lives in a very real way when we begin to follow Jesus. Before knowing Jesus, before following Jesus, we don't really get it. But see, after we start following Jesus, we realize that people matter. It's when we realize that we have to make things right between us. When things are going wrong, we say, okay, it's not about me. This is when we understand that all humanity matters to God, and therefore, we should do our part to care for others. Now again, this doesn't mean that we hang out with everybody. Some people just clash. It's okay. I know that's another thing that we never shake our head about. But it's true. Some people just clash. 
And when you clash with somebody, you probably don't want to be around them a lot. Yet you find yourself caring about their soul. Right? Even though you don't want to be around them, you know somewhere deep in your spirit, you care about them finding Christ. <coughs> you may even long for them to know Him as Savior. That's called a burden. It's called a burden and it's placed on us who follow Christ because without a burden, we're not moved. We're given burdens for people and for things like that so that we will do something about it. Romans 13.8 says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. What's the law? Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? And love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else will be accomplished if we do these two things. That's what Jesus said. So that's the law. It's funny how that happens to be about love. Right? 1 Peter 1.22 says, Having purified your souls by the, your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. In other words, don't hold back. Love other people in a way that will show them their need for Christ. If you struggle to spend time with them, just know that you're loving them as Christ loved you when you were unbearable to be around. And if you don't think you ever were, ask somebody in your life. <laughs> it may be hard for us to step out of our comfort, comfort zones, our comfortable places, to show somebody that we don't really want to be around, what it means to love Christ. But every time we do, we receive a blessing. Every time we receive a blessing. Maybe someone asks us to pray for their salvation. Or maybe someone shows kindness in a way that they don't normally show kindness. Or maybe we receive an extra infilling of God's joy. Whatever happens, it's always a blessing to step into God's will and allow Him to use you. Loving people we don't like to be around is hard for all of us. But I believe it's what Jesus asks of His followers. See, I think that's what He's saying through Matthew. When He had Matthew write chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect. Uh-oh. You have to be perfect. As your Heavenly Father is perfect. Can you see why love is a power tool worth understanding? Can you see why love is a power tool all of us should want in our toolbox, our toolkit? Can you see why love is a power tool that changes lives? Ours and then the people that we love? Can you see why love is a power tool worth finding at all costs? I want to end this morning with one more scripture passage. It spoke to me as I read it this past week, and my prayer is that it speaks to you and moves you to a place where Christ Jesus can minister to you and through you. It's found in John 15. Not 1 John, but John 15. Verses 9 through 17. 
says this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that you will love one another. Will you stand with me? Lord God, I pray that you would help us to love. I pray, Lord, that you would show us how to love. Actually, Lord, I pray that you would show us how to die so that you can love through us. We know that every time we try to love in our humanness, we get in our way. We get in your way. We get in the way of love. So God, love us as you have planned to love us. And love through us so that we can make a difference for you everywhere we go. Help us, Lord, to pick up these tools that you give us and live with them every day of our lives. We we'll give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Sing with me. I think Barb's going to play it, but I don't know if I want to do it. No, she wants us to sing an acapella. <laughs> All right, sing with me. We sing hallelujah, let the kingdom come in our hearts, in our homes. Let your will be done as we go in your name. We shout and we proclaim, let your 